Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have you here with us today. It's a special occasion because we've managed to bring together six really distinguished speakers to whom I extend warm thanks for making time to be with us. There's a little bit of talk about how there's quite a lot of online content, but to counter that, I would say that if I were to try to bring these six people together under one roof today, it would have been impossible. So we're really thrilled that we can be together on Zoom. We have Dr. Uli Stig from uh, Switzerland, Mohamed Afghani in Switzerland, Abraham Karabajakian in Lebanon, Eli in Dubai, Romak Dokho in Bangkok, and Joanna in France. So we are truly international. Today's occasion marks the beginning of the Abu Dhabi Summer Program, which includes an Artist of the Week campaign and a talks program, of which this is uh, a first one. Please catch our second panel on the 24th of June. This is chaired by Mariam Eisler and promises to be a fascinating occasion. Um, the, this also marks the launch of the summer catalog of the Abu Dhabi Art Fair. I really encourage everyone to visit the Abu Dhabi Art website and you'll have all this information. And uh, the talk today, although it's a closed session, will eventually go on YouTube so you can watch it later if necessary. First and foremost, I wanted to thank very much uh, Abu Dhabi Art Fair for inviting us all to be here and bringing us together. I wanted to thank the wonderful Abu Dhabi Art team. And um, without making too much uh, of a further ado, I'm going to turn over to our panelists because in fact, given what they have to tell us, you know, what makes this session unique is that although each person here is a global citizen, they also have a special connection to the region. And they're going to tell us about why collecting is important to them, what is their connection to the region, how do they see the present, how do they see the future. So I'm personally really excited to hear what they have to say. I'm going to first turn to Jean-Marc de Croix, who lived in Hong Kong for the past 20 years and presently in Bangkok, as I say. He's an expert member of the French National Chamber of Experts in relation to Chinese art and also the European Federation of Experts. He's a curator, a collector, a writer, and he's focused on emerging markets right now, he's writing a book about Iran. So Jean-Marc, please take us through what you do and tell us, first of all, what was the first piece you acquired? What does collecting mean to you and what's close to your heart? Uh, yes, good afternoon. Actually, uh, this is my first uh, painting that I bought when I started uh, seriously collecting. I was in my late uh, 30s. And this is a painting by Chinese uh, established artist, Zhang Yao Gang, from his uh, series called the uh, Red Bloodline series. Uh, that series started in 1993, this one is from 1996. But then I became quite involved with Chinese art and then I uh, started writing books. I've been uh, <clears throat> admitted in, uh, uh, in the uh, Chamber of Experts in France. This the second one is uh, my favorite artist of the young generation, Wang Yu Yang, is obsessed with moon. And then there's one uh, <clears throat> very big sculpture of four meter diameter with seven thousand bulbs. And the other one painting is a two meter fifty oil and is actually the <clears throat> face of the moon, which have been uh, uh, discovered by Chinese early last year is the, the hidden face of moon. But then after China, I became more interested in uh, uh, other emerging scenes. Uh, the reason is because I thought, <clears throat> this is uh, Indonesia, one of the good artists in Indonesia. I thought is really, uh, <clears throat> the art world has been dominated for 200 years by basically North Atlantic, which is uh, New York, London, and Paris. And I thought uh, it's more interesting to look at other things because it's different taste, different culture, different music. And also this domination of the North Atlantic has been lasting for 200 years. And I think 200 years is a bit too long and it's, uh, it, it has to change. So I uh, focused on really emerging scenes such as Indonesia, but also Middle East, Pakistan, Africa, India, Iran, and also Morocco is a new generation. This is Eko Negro is another Indonesian artist, those two. And Tang and Eko Negro were representing Indonesia for the Venice Biennale uh, six, years, six years ago. Then uh, some were, uh, because those artists are not very established, I thought it's good to show some image because uh, not, maybe not so familiar with, uh, with the collectors. 
This one is a series by Hassan Sharif. It's old painting of two meters high. And actually, Hassan Sharif was a caricaturist uh, before he moved to London. And this is uh, reflecting on, on his, uh, this aspect. It's called Press Conference. It's very critical about uh, political people. They look like crooks. They look like gangsters. It's a group of five. Okay, there's four here. And of course, uh, Hassan Sharif is more well known for other aspects like Arte Povera or semi system. This is Pakistan. This is uh, an artist called Anwar, ja uh, Anwar Jalal Shemza. And um, he influenced a lot of young artists from uh, Pakistan, such as uh, uh, Fat Burki, uh, Ali Kazim. And I'm very interested in what's happening in uh, Pakistan at the moment. Another one. OK, in Africa, uh, this is Otto Bungen Kanga. Uh, can we come back? Autobahn Kanga, she's uh, from Nigeria, but she lived in Belgium. Uh, she was in Documenta and she was in Venice Biennale last year. She also got an award from Sharjah Biennale. And uh, I think she's immensely talented. I, I like her very much. This is a six meter 12 uh, tapestry. And there's an edition of three. One of them is actually uh, exhibited at uh, Pompidou Center in Paris. Then, uh, there's an Iranian artist living in Dubai, Rokni Rissadeh. This is a uh, uh, um, watercolor with gesso and is about a tale, Abla and Antara, which is very famous in the Middle East. It's like <coughs> a color between a slave and a princess. Another one by Rokni, after that, is a six meter uh, oil on canvas panel and is actually the first Abu Dhabi which was uh, organized by DTAC. And it's very ironical and uh, funny because you can see the famous uh, works by the artists like Subodh Gupta, uh, 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 yes. Jeff Koons, and, uh, and uh, also the dealers and also the visitors from uh, Abu Dhabi, the men in white, the women in black. It's interesting. Yeah. Maybe and the Emirates know. Palace and the Emirates Palace in the background. That's right. This was the first, uh, first time it was in the Emirates Palace. Yeah. Another one. Okay, that's a young artist from uh, Iran. He's actually from Tabriz, which is north of Iran. And he's only uh, 32 years old. And then it's like secret boxes with many elements. Everything is done by hand. So it's a uh, paint, all painting and drawings and machines. And it's full of uh, secrets which you discover little by little. He's very talented. He didn't have the gallery before, but he's now represented by Dastan in uh, Tehran. Uh, Morocco, Moroccan Arsene. So Mohamed Beheli is actually part of the Casablanca uh, school together with Farid Belkaya and also Shaba. But among the three uh, is the only one who is alive today. And uh, they influence very much the young generation of Moroccan artists. And I think what's happening there is really interesting. So there's a group of artists uh, working with the post-internet movement and also uh, very talented between 30 and 40 years old. Uh, people like uh, 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 Eli Kouri, no, uh, what's the name? Sorry. A few artists from that generation. Uh, there's another one after this image. Uh, Saïd Afifi, and then he's using a computer software of architecture to make this big canvas with rocks, which is quite impressive. I don't want to take, to, well, this is the post-internet uh, movement in uh, Morocco, so Yakut Kabaj, and it's called uh, Old Beach. It's actually some uh, software bugs. So it's with really the software bugs. I think I don't want to take, this is uh, Oda Kashia, she's an Iranian artist, and she's also post-internet uh, using the screen and the various connection with the internet. And the third one, and big we go quickly because I don't want to take too much time. Uh, Yasin Khaled, out of voice, it's again uh, using some bugs, software bugs. That's it for me. Well, lovely. Thank you so much, Omar. Like you, I'm really thrilled to hear that the domination of North Atlantic should not be necessarily what dictates art production and interest and focus on art. So thank you 
for being focused on other things as well. And, and it was so interesting for me to see Shemsa's work because Anwar Shemsa and his preoccupation with geometry speaks to my own obsession with geometry. That was really interesting. Now, I'd love to turn to uh, Mo Aframi, who is an entrepreneur and well-known collector, a very well-recognized art patron. He's based in Dubai and Gstaad and speaks to us from Gstaad right now. His collection has been shown at the Algahan Museum and at the, uh, and the Houston Museum of Fine Arts. And he's recently produced a really beautiful book uh, on his collection. So Mohammed, please tell us about the first thing you bought and your journey in collecting. Well, thank you, Roxanne. And thank you, uh, Art Abu Dhabi, for organizing such a <laughs> distinguished panel. I feel humbled to be with such uh, esteemed collectors as the other members you've, you know, you've gathered today. Uh, for me, I really started collecting in 2005, and my first two <laughs> works were actually at the same time I bought them uh, in Tehran were from uh, the two modern great artists, Masoud Arabshahi and Sirak Melkonian. Both artists, you know, uh, were very important uh, to the sort of growth of the Iranian art scene. And in fact, it was, it was sort of a sweet story because it wasn't any sort of deliberate strategy. I was on a trip to visit my family and I ended up staying a couple more weeks in Tehran. And after having seen all my uh, extended relatives, I had time on my hands. And my good friend, Sirius Jahan, who's a sort of family and lifelong friend, took me to see a few of the galleries. And to give you a sense, like in 2005, there were maybe half a dozen contemporary art galleries in Iran. I mean, certainly in Tehran anyway. Uh, today, there are over 100 uh, Friday afternoons have become like a pastime for many uh, residents in Tehran seeing all the different galleries. So the scene has really exploded and, and much more so to the sort of modern and contemporary scene. Mm -hmm. And I bought these two works for the princely sum of $500 uh, a piece. And, you know, I was very, very happy with myself because I thought, you know, how great is it to be able to buy art from your own country? You know, by background, I'm of Iranian origin. And, uh, and it was really, you know, something that allowed me to sort of connect with my country, but on my own terms. Uh, and art being so apolitical, uh, I thought this was a fantastic way to sort of reconnect with Iran. And I was based in Dubai and I was sort of spending more and more time uh, visiting the countries of the region. And um, anyway, uh, I, I, I sort of grew from there. I roped in my sort of collaborator and partner in this endeavor, which was my mother. And we sort of started to amass artworks, primarily to sort of collect my newly bought apartment in Dubai. And of course, as uh, you know, all my fellow art collectors on, on this panel know, you know, it starts small and then it ends up getting quite large if you don't put it under control. And so I quickly saw that, you know, I had more than enough works to fill my walls and the strategy for the collection became something different. Because obviously, once you fill your walls, what are you, what are you really collecting for? To put it in your storage? That doesn't make sense. So, you know, my mother and I spent some time thinking about how to best, um, you know, have a strategy and a direction for the collection. And we decided it made sense to create like a really deep archive of our works and try to have a good cross-section of artists from the 50s until present day. And we sort of loosely defined you know, Iranian modern art is pre-revolution. So pre-1979, I would sort of say is a good cutoff for modern Iranian art. And then post-1979, I would sort of say that would be a good definition for contemporary. Uh, the collection today has about 600 works. Uh, 150 or so are non-Iranian and 450 are Iranian. Uh, we've helped uh, back publications, both independent from our collection, uh, to make sure that there's some permanent literature on these artists, because obviously one of the challenges of, of promoting Iranian art is that there isn't that much literature about them. And of course, as we all know from our own studies and our own experiences, uh, at the end of the day, some artists are fashionable for a period of time. And then, you know, they tend to sort of sometimes dissolve into the history of, of the sands of time. And so, so it's important to have some record of these artists. And, you know, we were doing that. We were very active in helping uh, secure some of those artists' residencies, both in the region and out of the region. I think we also worked very hard to make sure that some of these, let's say, more talented and 
desirable artists ended up uh, being represented by larger, you know, Western dealers, because at the end of the day, as Jean-Marc said, you know, the dominant art scene in the world for the last 200 years certainly has been uh, in these North Atlantic nations. And if you wanted to have a global footprint, you need to have some penetration and some presence there. And of course, as you know, Dubai became a really fantastic hub for, for the region. Uh, and, you know, many galleries sprouted there, uh, most notably in the Al Sarkal district. So it's been a sort of wonderful evolution to watch this scene develop. And of course, it's had its ups and its downs. But I would say it's, it's firmly ensconced. You know, you're now seeing a lot of Iranian and Arab artists as well. I have to commend my friends in Saudi as well, because they're really, uh, you know, taking the sort of the new lead and in, in promoting their culture and, and their region. And I think that all these initiatives to help promote the general broader Middle Eastern art scene uh, are important. And this is sort of what really drives me today. Of course, we continue to collect. Uh, one of the things that we've done is over the last six months between the sanctions in Iran and the sort of COVID uh, crisis, which as many of you know, has been terrible globally, but it was particularly bad in Iran. Uh, these artists have no real lifeline. So we've systematically um, developed a joint program with Dastan Gallery, who, who Jean-Marc alluded to for his Nasser Bakshi purchase, uh, who are basically you know, buying artworks across a cross-section of artists so that they're at least uh, you know, finding a way to, to be patroned by you know, our foundation, our collection, so that you know, they can get through this very difficult period. Um, and then at the same time, which we can talk about in more detail later, we're also uh, going to be unveiling, hopefully, a virtual museum of our collection <laughs> up to the sort of times that we're in now, uh, where hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have uh, a good cross-section of the collection available to the whole public with a deep archive so that, you know, those who are studying Middle Eastern art will have a, a resource to draw to. So we're being busy. We're trying to do as much as possible to stay relevant and adapt to the fact that we're in an environment where I think people are going to be increasingly uncomfortable to be in crowded, uh, crowded environments like museums. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mohammed. So fascinating that you mentioned various things you touch on. For one thing, you come from three generations of collectors. So as you say, there is a continuity and your family has been supportive to Iranian art and Middle Eastern art over time. It's extraordinary what you've achieved since only 2005. You know, when I think of everything that has happened, and of course you pointed to one thing that all collectors think about, which is that you bought something first for $500, and now, of course, the value. And I have to tell all the audience that I sit here thinking that I was part of this exhibition, so to speak. I knew about the exhibition where Farhad Moshiri's work was being sold in London and Leighton House for $4,000. And, you know, I'm pretty much kicking myself that I didn't buy at least two or three works at that time. <laughs> And it is, you touch on another very important thing, Mohammed, which is this patronage, the support of the artists. And of course, we're going to talk about the COVID and the pandemic effect later on, but supporting publications, supporting, you know, having this commissioner role, if you like, is a very important one. I'd now like to turn to Dr. Uli Singh, whose journey in art collecting is absolutely extraordinary. We are really privileged to have you here today with us Dr. Sig, you are a venerated figure in your field of collecting Chinese art. In 1980, you established the first joint venture between China and the West. You've been an ambassador to China, to North Korea and Mongolia, and your collection has featured over 2,500 works. You've established a number of prizes and awards, and you've donated part of your collection. So the list is so long, I can't um, mention all of it. I do recommend the audience to look on the Abu Dhabi Art website for the bios of our distinguished panelists because it will be fascinating to see about their journeys. Please, Dr. Stig, tell us what was the first piece you bought and tell us about your special journey. Uh, you have to unmute. You have to unmute. Great. Lovely. Okay, I'll be there. So again, thank you, Roxanne. Uh, my trajectory to a collector hasn't been very straightforward. And uh, my first acquisition I did when I was a student, this is like, you know, 50 years ago. And uh, 
it was a friend of mine who went bankrupt. And so I bought a painting of a Swiss surrealist. That was the first acquisition. Not very telling yet for what happened later. And the same week, I remember, I went to the first Art Basel. For the first time I went to Art Basel. And since in the past I could never come to grips with abstract art, I thought I need to buy an abstract painting. Mm -hmm. So you know, maybe I will get there. So I bought a very small painting. Someone had punched a hole into it, so it was really cheap. It was a fatal Spanish abstract painter painting. So that's how I started to accumulate. I didn't consider myself collector. Mm -hmm. uh, I started to consider myself collector when I was working and uh, spending a lot of time in China. I was fortunate to be there from day one of contemporary art. And such interesting coincidence, it was also 79, like in Iran, uh, where, you know, contemporary Chinese art has its beginnings. So I could see it, but I didn't buy anything at that time. I was looking with a Western eye, admittedly with a Western eye, at the art production of that time. And it was very derivative of Western art. So I couldn't decide you know, to go forward, collect. I only years later, uh, when I took a new look at Chinese contemporary art, because Chinese artists, in my view, by then had found their own language. Uh, then I start to buy uh, some Chinese works. And doing that, I realized that no one was collecting Chinese contemporary art. We speak now early 90s. And uh, no one in any but very random way. I thought this very old in the biggest cultural space of the world. No one cares what Chinese contemporary artists were contributing to their own culture. So I redefined my focus, not collect what I like, which I did in the past, but to create uh, what I call a document about Chinese contemporary art, which actually a national institution should have done, but did not. So that's why I collected in such irrational way some 2,600 works, Chinese contemporary artists. And uh, I was trying to mirror the Chinese art production across all media, along the timeline. I had to collect backwards as well to be able to, start to show the storyline of Chinese contemporary art. So that's how I, you know, in the end, <laughs> became what I myself also consider a collector. Thank you and so maybe much. Just to, finish, to finish that, I then uh, gave a substantial part, some 1,500 works, to a museum in Hong Kong, because I felt uh, that is where this storyline of Chinese contemporary art you know, should be housed. So hopefully in one year from now, this museum will open. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sig. We're really fascinated to hear this you point, and of course, one lesser fact known about you is that you've been to Iran, that you've taken an interest in Iranian art as well. And it's so interesting for me that you touch upon the fact that sometimes in the emerging art uh, markets, we see this derivative kind of voice. And, but what we've heard so far from each of the collectors is that there's been the, this consciousness to have a public service, to have a public function. And I'm fascinated to say that you weren't actually collecting what you loved necessarily, but with a view to creating documentation uh, of Chinese art. So this is really fantastic. And of course, another person who's uh, got very much public service on her mind has been Joanna. And Joanna is um, a leading collector of post-war and contemporary art. She has worked for over 25 years in the arts as a writer, film producer, cultural figure, and patron. She's worked with the Edinburgh International Cultural Summit and in 2018 launched the Schliemann Residency in Provence for young talent. And she's also been a voice for women. Her father lives in Dubai, so she comes and goes and she's no stranger to the region. But Joanna, with all of this, and you've been a supporter of Delphina Foundation, clearly you've had public service in mind. Tell us more about what was the first thing you bought 
and how you see your collecting activity. Well, first of all, uh, thank you so much, Roseanne, for my, inviting me to this panel. I'm a very humble collector um, compared to my co-panelists here. Um, I actually came to collecting by being a practitioner. I uh, always made art as a young person and then went to the Parsons School of Design. And actually the first artworks I bought were of my fellow students. Um, and I've always been interested in creative processes. So I come a little bit from the other side. Um, my then sort of uh, first acquisition with a name was a collage of a photo collage of Peter Beard. And I, I was working at the time in Los Angeles as an assistant producer. And I think the medium sort of uh, seduced me. And uh, although I didn't collect photography until much, much later, actually just fairly recently. Um, I guess the collage uh, always speaks for what I like to do. I like to really merge different disciplines and I'm interested in the intersection of different arts um, uh, disciplines. So I also grew up with a lot of art from, uh, you know, very different regions from you know, uh, my father had business um, very much in the Far East, in the Middle East and Africa, and he always brought back uh, uh, artworks from those regions. So for me, art was always about uh, cultural dialogue and, and exchanging ideas. It also is, for me, collecting is not just owning things. It's investing and amplifying new ideas, new concepts, like, um, for example, cooking sections. I've just hosted a dinner and we have a sort of salon where ideas are debated. And this is about uh, uh, sort of how we can uh, tackle uh, sort of climate change induced by humans through what we eat and consume. Um, their professors, uh, cooking sections, uh, Alan and Daniel, are uh, spatial, um, uh, uh, they call themselves spatial architects, and they uh, teach at the Royal College of Art. Um, so I always like to invest in ideas that I think are, are needed for society to evolve. We also invest in plays, with the Bush Theater um, and with our residency here, it's also about engaging in your environment, be it nature and people. There's the Rencontre d'Al, the Luma, uh, where sustainability is also a very important factor. And yes. I think, although we have a very humble collection, um, it's all about social change and reflecting on society. And, um, uh, it's also about changing your own perspective. That's very important to me. Thank you. That's, that's wonderful, actually. What an important point, investing in ideas and also investing in young artists, as you do with your residencies. I would love to turn to Eli Puri, who is well known in the UAE as chairman of Omnicom, uh, leading me, uh, the leading media group. He's a well-known regional personality, he coaches and mentors entrepreneurs and startups, but also finds time to indulge his passion for the arts. I do know personally that he's an incredible sportsman. Um, he has many talents. Uh, and as I said before to some friends, when I first arrived in the UAE, the first uh, instruction I was given is to try to meet Ali Khoury because he was always interested in the arts, was one of the leaders, the first people to get into this in a serious way. Uh, his company's regional headquarter has been transformed into a, pri into a vibrant private museum. Eli, please tell us about your fabulous journey and what was the first thing you bought? Thank you, Roxanne. It was a very flattering introduction, so I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for the Abu Dhabi uh, art team and for putting this together. Uh, as you said, I'm not a collector by, by it's not my job, it's, uh, it's a passion. And when you look at it as a passion, um, you know, like all passions, you make mistakes. So I was collecting, I was kind of buying art for decorative reasons for, um, for decades, for the last two or three decades. But my true, you know, when I started truly collecting was over 10 years ago, when I bought a piece 
for uh, the Lebanese artist, Lebanese American artist, Nabil Nahas. I'm sure you all uh, know Nabil. It was a piece called So Happy to See You. So as a young artist, as a young collector, sorry, I, what, uh, what attracted me in that piece of work was the vibrancy of colors, was the texture, and most importantly was the meaning of such a piece of work, which, which evoked a lot of um, uh, positiveness, a lot of great, great things, great vibes. Over the years, naturally, I made a lot of mistakes like all young collectors do. So I was buying on impulse. I was just buying things that I like spontaneously, not thinking about the implication of, of those pieces of work and, and the collection. But over the years, I um, started to work with mm -hmm. advisors because again, I don't have a lot of time to do the research. So I work with advisors and, re and recently over the last four years, I've been working with an advisory firm in New York and Dubai and they've been doing a great job at guiding me and you know, helping me find you in the collection. So the collection is a combination of Middle Eastern and international artists uh, from emerging, emerging artists and more established ones. Um, and uh, it's a constant learning, it's a constant development. Um, what I like about art and artists basically, I like people that are challenging the norms, people that are pushing the boundaries, people that are addressing issues about race, about gender, about um, migration, about social issues. And uh, I like when I look at a piece of art, I like to gaze at it and uh, look at it and every time discover something new and keep evolving with the piece of work. Uh, I keep changing the collection at home so it doesn't stay the same. Every nine to 12 months, I keep rotating the work. Uh, hopefully share it with as many people as possible as well. Um, I always struggle to say, to think about is art an investment or is it a, a something that you use to decorate the walls? And I think a lot of uh, experts would disagree on, on, these, on these two notions. And I would like to caution young collectors that maybe art is not an investment if you don't buy wisely. And again, you have to really know what you're doing. You have to know why you're getting into art. Is it for your own pleasure or is it to own an asset that is gonna appreciate over time? So to me, a great piece of art is, is a piece of work that sits at the intersection of a great idea as one. The second one, a great artist that has a great career and is addressing, again, this, the issues that we talked about that are compelling in today's world. And the third one is the material and, and the, the, the medium. Is it uh, an installation? Is it a, piece of, is it a piece of sculpture? Is it a canvas and what have you? So anything that sits in between those three things and is great is something that resonates with me. Um, recently, I've been passionate about, um, you know, demystifying art and helping young collectors understand and appreciate art in a much, in a much, much, much more compelling way. Uh, because young collectors are basically faced with three questions. What do I buy? That naturally, what is, what is the price of what I'm buying? And is it gonna be a good investment? So I think uh, collectively as an industry, we have to aid those young collectors to, to come to grip with those questions. And so that we all raise the market and, and make it a much more, uh, you know, inviting and, and uh, vibrant market. So this is uh, quickly my story. Thank you so much, Eli. You also raised extraordinarily important points about exactly what questions people ask themselves when they get into collecting. You really made an important point about the fact that one shouldn't be afraid to make mistakes. It does happen and every great collector will mention uh, that they have made mistakes and I can clearly see that you carry your mentoring uh, passion into collecting as well because what you've said is really important advice for those who start out. Now, last but not least, I'm coming to Abraham Karabajakian, who was an early aficionado of collecting. Abraham has been a leading patron of the arts in Lebanon, curating, supporting, and driving the Beirut art scene. In, tw in 2012, he founded the KA Modern and Contemporary Art Collection in Beirut, which I visited myself, and I can testify that it's a fabulous, really fabulous collection, which everyone must make an appointment to go and see when they go to Beirut. It's open to the public by appointment. He initiated and curated a seminal exhibition featuring pioneers of Lebanese uh, female artists. So, um, and he has actually in his bio, please check the website, given a beautiful quote about what art means to him. So Abraham, please tell us about your first piece and your journey. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you, Roxanne, for your kind, kind words, and thank you for having us all here. It's really uh, enlightening. Uh, I think after listening to these fabulous journeys of all these very important collectors, uh, I will start with the question, your second question, which was about what does collecting mean to you? I think after I, I listen to, to all these uh, very nice journeys, I say collecting is the adventure and, and and it's all about this journey that is filled with culture, with filled with uh, with discoveries, and filled with, with knowledge and and beauty. So, uh, so this is collecting, and uh, uh, I, I have witnessed a lot of it since I, I started uh, when, uh, my last years of university. And uh, so, every every painting has a, has a history, has a story. And it has a double advantage when you look at it. The first one is its beauty when you appreciate it, and the second one is what's behind it, how you got it, what did you do for it, etc. So that's the interesting part of the collecting. Uh, of course, no one of us, uh, no one decided to become a collector because you just buy art because you like it, or you just trespass into a gallery and then you, you like something. There's no purpose for becoming a collector. And then with time, when like everyone said, you don't have place on your walls, they start calling you a collector. Uh, I, my, my first acquisition was, I mean, I was, it was a long time ago, I was very young, didn't have much means. It was a print by a Yugoslav painter. Yes, there was, Yugoslavia was still there, uh, named Kiro Urdin. And uh, it was called La Princesse des Caraïbes. I'm sorry, I don't have pictures like Jean-Marc, he's always better prepared. Uh, but uh, yeah, that 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 print had uh, a very interesting story for every young collector because my message through it is that I mean I didn't know what a print me meant. Uh, the, the, the gallerist uh, told I couldn't afford the real painting, so the gallerist explained to me that you have lithographies, etchings, etc. Uh, uh, this this gives the message to every young collector or or every newcomer into art that art should not and is not limited to uh, wealthy and rich people. Anybody can buy art. Uh, Muhammad's first paintings were at $500. I mean, uh, it's not about wealth, it's about uh, culture, taste. And, and when I talk about taste, uh, I insist on it because taste is a muscle and with time, you, you, you should build it. And it's very important to build it up uh, by visiting uh, exhibitions, visiting museums, uh, reading books, making research. Uh, and if you don't have time, I mean, like Eli, uh, you, can, you can always have a personal trainer, <laughs> an art advisor that can help you accelerate your knowledge. And, and what's nice in art is that it's an eternal knowledge. You will continue to learn. You will always discover a newcomer, a new artist who's here, uh, a contemporary artist who's, who's trying his best to, become, uh, to be part of the modern art uh, of tomorrow. Uh, so yes, the collection is, is more about modern art because I, I, uh, I was lucky to, to, to meet my partner, uh, Roger Aouli, and to uh, initiate together the KA collection, Kababajakian Aouli collection. It was the... the, the uh, the, the idea was that art should be seen and we, we don't have museums in Lebanon to show uh, especially modern art, which is the most important thing in our art history, uh, is, to, is, is to show it and, and to, uh, to learn about our history. So we, we, we decided to build up a collection to develop the initial collection that I had and, and together uh, we were stronger and we, we did the KA art space where we hanged part of the collection and uh, I hope that everybody can visit it and would like it. Uh, so it's, it's important to me to, uh, uh, to give a message to the future uh, uh, artists, the contemporary artists, that your art will not be gone with time. I mean, modern art was the contemporary art of yesterday and and giving importance to the modern art will give hope to the contemporary artists of today. 
that will, that they, they will, their, their art will remain and will last, I mean, forever, I hope. Uh, so this was the message behind it, and uh, this is why we did this space. And I'm trying as much as I can to continue. Uh, things are becoming difficult uh, in the region, both financially and et cetera, but uh, we, we do our best to continue encouraging art, doing exhibitions. That's also the other big message of a collector, showing art. Without showing art, nobody will know about it. Nobody would like something that he doesn't know about. Uh, so these are the two or three messages that I would give. Uh, Fantastic. So, that, so you're talking about engagement, and that's a very important part. Every single person on this pan panel has created some form of engagement, public service, and so on. And in fact, I would love to be able to uh, quote you, because to say taste is a muscle, and you have to train it. That's a very important point, uh, Abraham, and I request your permission to use that quote later. It's wonderful. Uh, we already have an audience question for uh, Dr. Singh. Puli, you are asked, why did you decide on a museum uh, to devote it? The question is actually, why donate a collection to a museum in China and not in your own home country? Yes, that's fine. You're uh, unmuted. Okay. Um, why not in Switzerland, so to speak? Yes. Um, of course, the collection has a, an uh, important cultural value because no such other document exists as this yeah. collection. If one would want to read the storyline from the beginning uh, of contemporary art to 2012, that's when I did the donation. Um, I already put the collection together in order to give it to China. I simply didn't know when and how and to whom. So, uh, because the Chinese uh, people do not know their own contemporary art. So, for me, that was never a question, go elsewhere. And, of course, in you know other global cities, the big institutions, some I'm part of, sure they would have loved to take the collection, but we know the fate of it, you know, I would get a, a grandiose show maybe, and then everything disappears in the storage. And I would un have to understand because Chinese contemporary art is not their core business. Their core business is normally the art where they are situated. So, you know, for all these reasons, uh, I had very early on determined it must be in China. And I was negotiating with the Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, but uh, Hong Kong made a very, very big effort and had on their, uh, you know, planning on their drawing board, this uh, fantastic museum, uh, which is now going to be accomplished in about one year from now while th that situation in mainland China was still somewhat unclear. And then there was also a censorship issue. Uh, of course, you know, in China we have to accept there is some censorship, but no one was clear, couldn't make clear to me what the rules are. So in the end, I decided for Hong Kong. Thank you so much for, for answering that, which now brings us to the sort of hot preoccupation of the moment, which is now we're in this pandemic era. So we're sort of in the middle of it, we're not over it. So I can't really uh, sort of put to you what does collecting mean post COVID, which was the title of this talk. It's going to be more about what do you think are the effects of this period? And I'm sure as very seasoned collectors, we'd love to hear your predictions. Um, one thing, for example, is the pandemic going to mean the end of performance or site-specific art? You know, will, will the art production itself change? Will the show-off extravagant art uh, evolve into more art that we like to live with? Uh, and we're going to be more at home, so we're going to be collecting from home. I'd love to hear predictions. And uh, I know this is a silly thing to say because as an auction house, former auction house person, when people ask me for a prediction, I hated it. I didn't like making predictions, but let's talk about how you see the present and the future. I'm going to ask Mohammed this question. 
Wow. Well, I mean, I think short term, I think art will take a little bit of a hit because I think it can never be underestimated, the visual, uh, the in-person experience of art. Mm -hmm. And that's hard to do from your house, no matter how uh, attractive a presentation you make over the web. Um, however, I'm optimistic that this pandemic will eventually be under control um, and you'll see you know, this continued full frontal approach to the art world where you'll see a continual explosion of more and more uh, art fairs, shows, more challenging installations. But I think that the scope of the art world has become so vast. And what is art today is such a broad uh, interpretation uh, that I think that's gonna be very hard to sort of uh, suppress those creative juices even, even by our friend, Mr. COVID-19. So uh, I'm optimistic. I think short term, it'll be a little bit tough. I think also economically, uh, you know, I think some of the obviously wealthy collectors will continue to collect and seek opportunities. Uh, but I think, you know, to ordinary folk who want to get a little bit of art, you know, they're going to have to, they're going to have to look at, you know, more affordable, sort of artworks is something that I think is, is going to be a big growth area for the art world. Um, but I'm optimistic. I think that, you know, art is so important and, and no virus will, will suppress it. Jean-Marc, what do you think? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I think art is really a product of first necessity because it really enriches your life. So I don't think it will be stopped by COVID. It will carry on. But maybe there will be economic hardship, so the people may spend less. So as a consequence, it could be switching from a more established artists towards younger artists, discoveries, uh, emerging artists. And as for the question on uh, performance and uh, <clears throat> installation, I think there's more and more interest for that field. The latest example is maybe Desert Alula, which happened in January and February, and there were 9,000 visitors for those five months. Wow. And I think it was successful. And I think, uh, anyway, with COVID, you cannot have a big audience, but uh, many of the performances were recorded by video and photo. And uh, also, there can be an audience with uh, Zoom or with uh, online, you know, like we're doing today. So I think, on the contrary, there will be more interest for performance and installation. I'm quite confident about that. Well, now, uh, I have many questions, but there are pressing questions from the audience. One is, addressed to Joanna. Um, the audience wants to know more about your artist in residence, prog uh, in residence program in Provence and what is the overarching role? Is this, I mean, actually this ties in well with the pandemic situation as well because support of artists during the pandemic is very important. Yes, of course. Sadly, we had to cancel this year's resident. A very talented artist from New Zealand called Zach Langdon Paul. Um, but we cancelled it because the Rencontre d'Arles and de Luma are closed. And we invite these artists for six weeks, and it's an award which we have created together with the Berlin Masters, Matthias Arndt, um, uh, for emerging artists under 30 in photography, new media, video, and VR. Um, as we've seen, I'm producing myself currently uh, a piece based on an Arab tale, actually with Shizad Dawood. I'm very interested in VR, also especially regarding with the current situation with COVID and uh, new experiences in the art world from a completely different angle. But it's all about, again, it's about dialogue, about exchange of ideas. And to have these artists who live in Berlin, they don't have to be German or from Berlin, but who live and work in Berlin, to have them here in the south of France and meet all the artists that show and uh, spend the summer here with the Rencontre um, and uh, uh, with the Luma, uh, it's really about expanding your horizon. And uh, you can apply by with the Berlin Masters program, and then we had we had about a hundred people apply, and um, uh, one of them gets to stay here for six weeks. 
Lovely. Well, th uh, there are so many questions that I'm going to, as I say, put mine aside and uh, address the audience questions first. And from collector Andrew Wynn, what do each of the speakers believe will be the future of museums and art fairs in a post-COVID world? How should collectors drive engagement of the general public in a world where other concerns may appear more essential than collecting? And it, this does actually, a couple of other people have asked the same question. You know, how can you infect, uh, Mr. Mohamed Kanu asks, how do you infect the younger generation to love art and to collect? Where to start? And maybe given the pandemic situation, um, this becomes a little bit more pressing as a question than before, because art may not appear to be as much of a necessity as before. So I'm going to start with Ellie, because you've given us good advice on this panel so far. What do you think, Ellie, would be the way to engage, you know, and what's the role of collecting if it doesn't appear to be as much of a necessity as before? Well, it is a necessity to whoever feels it's a necessity. You cannot, you cannot not impose art on everyone. You have to want to embrace it and, um, you know, make it part of your life. I think COVID or not COVID, art is here to stay and museums are here to stay and art fairs are here to stay. I think that people cannot experience art just by looking at it virtually or looking yeah. at a website uh, or what we call today viewing rooms, which is a sexy word for a website. Um, you know, you can never have the same feeling when you see a piece of work live. So I think uh, what, what COVID will do is accelerate something that has been going for quite some time, which is the dig digitization of the art world. Basically, yeah. we, roughly 10% of, art, of uh, the art business is transacted online. And I think this will be accelerating, but what we're looking at is maybe up to 15% um, you know, of, of the total business would be done online. Because still major pieces of work uh, in excess of a few hundred thousand dollars will have to be seen in person to be acquired. You cannot buy a beautiful piece of work just by clicking online. This will be only for the smaller, smaller, younger artists. So I think, uh, you know, post COVID, you know, the fairs will come back again. I'm very optimistic. People will go to museums again and things will go back to normal. We're looking at a one year time and I'm quite optimistic that this will, will happen very soon. And uh, Uli, do you believe that, but I, the, do you, would you agree with Ellie? So sorry, would you, Eli, uh, Agree with Ellie? Do you think there has to be more effort in driving uh, art buying, engagement with art fairs, and so on? Or are you do you do you feel that uh, art is a necessity and people will continue to engage with art? I think it all depends what kind of scenario we underlay for the COVID future. You know, will it just be a blip which will pass? Which you know, I also share the hope that uh, some others have expressed here. Uh, I think then we will return to normalcy. And uh, of course, I'm uh, much older than everyone here. So I have gone through a few such moments. Actually, I should be careful because I would be a delicacy for the virus. But uh, I, for instance, think of the year 2000. We had a moment there. You know, the whole world was completely occupied in what will happen at the turn of the millennium because IT, you know, was such a big issue affecting everyone. Um, a lot of art actually was produced about that moment. And, you know, then nothing happened. And in hindsight, this art is not very meaningful. And we may see a somewhat comparable situation here. So I'm quite optimist as well that we will go back to normalcy. I have also seen the SARS um, period, 203. Actually, I flew to China. We were only two people in the plane. You know, it was dramatic for parts of the world, not like this here, but everyone forgot about it. And, Correct. you know, Correct. for good or bad, it may be somewhat similar. So I think we will return to normalcy. Does it mean, you know, art is for everyone? Because now maybe some people will not be able to collect for financial reasons. Uh, of course, in the Maslow pyramid, it's not the base. And to be honest, we don't really need art, but we love art. Of course, of course. Joanna, you were going to say something, and there's one yeah. more quick question I will put to everybody. 
after which we're going to talk about everybody's favorite work from the catalog because we're quickly running out of time. But Joanna, over to you now. I just want to say, if you look at young people, um, I think there is no way we will remain living a digital life. They're aching to go back, see each other. They, you know, they're out protesting, they're out seeing each other. And it might exacerbate a divide between the young and the old, which is really regrettable because I like the cross uh, uh, sort of inspiration between generations. But I don't think you can, it's, it's such a human need to feel and touch and talk with other people. Um, and, and I think the young are just the proof uh, of it. Um, so I think we will also, I think we will probably selection processes are going to take place more online. Before you go and see an e exhibition or you buy, you can yes. browse through quite well what yes. you want and what you don't want. So that's going to help. So that's actually, you can be much more targeted and choose. I also think it's much more democratic. You really can now enter the art world without sort of fitting into it or being part of it. You can spy if you so will, you know, uh, and, and look at everything. And if you're really fascinated, you can jump in, but you can without you know, any sort of uh, fear you might have. Um, uh, look at all the museums, all the galleries, all, and yes, it is limited, but you have access much better than before. Well, thank you for that. I have to say, as I say, there are many questions pouring in from the audience. It's absolutely impossible, sadly, to answer all of them. As I read them, most of them want to be mentored or given advice, exactly as Ellie started to do, to say, how do we start collecting? How do we avoid mistakes? What sort of basic budgets do we start from? So maybe this is something for Abu Dhabi Art Fair to think about later, which is a forum on a, a, a kind of giving advice and mentoring those who want to start out on collecting. But the final question I'm going to take is from Nadine Khalil at Canvas Magazine. She would like to ask Abraham, Eli, Mohammed, and Uli, well, obviously we'll have to select one of them and let it be Abraham, if I may, to say, to share your thought about how private collectors can better render their collections more publicly accessible, but perhaps physical or uh, virtual, but also through discourse. What kind of outreach needs to be done with media and industry professionals to reveal the significance of your collections, but also the role of each artist in the emerging non-Western art histories? So Abraham, you are already doing a little bit of this at KA Collection. You have, you have a wonderful Instagram account, which is highly educational. What would you do? I think first, uh, what you're doing today is part of all that, and I think it's very uh, helpful for everybody to to listen to what's happening and 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 to to take advice from others. Uh, like like I said before, showing art is very important because we ca we cannot like anything that we have not seen. So uh, many initiatives are being done by big collections. Uh, doing books, publishing books, uh, then uh, putting the collection online, uh, giving, I mean, lending paintings to museums, encouraging big exhibitions around different, uh, different artists and, and uh, gathering uh, collections to do that. Uh, there are many things that collectors already are doing. I, I mean, I think all of, uh, the persons on the on this panel has done a lot to to show and to uh, to show the importance about art, but I, I wanted to come back to your previous question in, in, in two words. I mean, there are two sections that we need to to uh, emphasize on. The first one is what is art? Why is it important? Art is the creativity of men, and 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 it's it's his, it's majorly his imagination and his creativity. This will always differentiate him from artificial intelligence. And, and this is why it should always remain. And I was thinking when I was confined, imagine if you're confined without art around you. I mean, it's very important to have your family, your loved ones, etc. But imagine you don't have art. It's important, even if it's not very expensive. There are many artists that are not expensive. So uh, I think 
um, anybody can buy art. Number two is the uh, easy, uh, easiness of uh, the, the capacity of the human beings to adapt. So uh, COVID will probably uh, be over soon, but if what we're doing today, all the uh, uh, developments that happened the last three months show that human beings can adapt very easily. And that's why I'm not afraid for the future. Uh, they will find solutions for anything. Thank so, you so uh, much. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I, I, I hate to be the timekeeper, but I, I'm getting a message to say we're running out of time. We just quickly have time to see slides of those who are going to talk. Each of you are going to talk about your favorite pick from the Abu Dhabi Art uh, e-catalog. We're going to start with Joanna Schlieven, and each of us are going to quickly talk about our favorite piece. Joanna, tell us about your favorite piece from the catalog. Yeah, I chose Christiana De Malci, White Arab Capitals, a bordery on canvas. I like this very much because it zones in on fluidity between the public and private spaces. And the disregard for personal space is really facilitated through social media. And I think it's a question we really need to ask ourselves about privacy. And I think the medium uh, is perfect because it is such a subtle intrusion um, of our private spaces through social media that this depicts this suppleness really well. I also think, again, in the time of COVID, it's, you know, our governments want to uh, follow us for our own sort of health sake reasons. Um, and it's very important we discuss these, these boundaries of, of, of supervision or, and privacy and public space. And I think it's also right, quite lyrical and poetic, very peaceful, this, this work. Lovely. Well, thank you so much. Now, quickly to Jean-Marc de Croix, who's chosen the Mounir Fatmi. Uh, Jean-Marc, tell us why you chose this one. Uh, yeah, so Mounir Fatmi is a Moroccan artist. He lived between uh, Tanger and Paris. And I think it's a very strong image. He's stainless steel saw with a surat from the Koran, and uh, which says there's a sort of a purification. So I thought it's very pure and a very uh, mystical and also a very strong image again. I admire uh, Munir very much. And he's also, I also like uh, the aspect we did with the connection. Uh, during yeah. the painting, he did some sculpture with uh, uh, cables, uh, connection cables, and also he did uh, between the books, connection between various uh, kind of books. I think he's yeah. a very strong artist. Fantastic. And then, Mohammed, you've chosen Sahand Hesamian, and I love his work. He was in the Venice Biennale. Tell us more about why you chose this one. Yeah, I chose this work because, you know, I've collected his work now. I guess the first work I've ever bought from him was in 2010 at a Magic of Persia event. And what I love about his work is he is really the perfect blend of the past and the present. And that when you see this work, it has this wonderful symmetry. Clearly, there's a lot of derivation from Islamic architecture. Yeah. At the same time, there's something mystical, poetic about it. Uh, I think it also has a very aesthetically slick appeal uh, in that, you know, if you have a contemporary home, this is a magnificent sculpture. Uh, I like him very much as well. He's a very humble guy. Uh, he's been a you know, an artist for both Dastan and Third Line. Uh, and, you know, I've seen some wonderful shows. And the most recent one was a giant version of this exact work, which was uh, on display at the last Be Venice Biennale. Venice Biennale, that, yeah. At the Spark Is You, which was organized by uh, Zeba Ardalan and, and the Parasol unit. And so when you see the work up close, you realize just how magical it is. Absolutely, yes. It is, it's a wonderful work and as you say, it touches upon this whole theme of geometry and uh, I talk about it in geometry and art in the modern Middle East. Really and I would, also add that, I would also add that it's, you know, affordable. This is like a single digit thousand type work. Yeah. So it's Indeed. attainable to any aspiring yeah. young collector. So we move on quickly to Abraham Karabajakian, who has been naughty and chosen four works to express which ones he liked mm -hmm. best. So Abraham, quickly tell us why these four works. Yeah, I'm gonna, I think it's not my fault, it's, it's uh, the, uh, <laughs> it's 
it's it's the wonderful uh, selection of uh, the curators who did this uh, uh, this online uh, selection. Uh, so I, I couldn't. I mean, I, I went. To, these are only the ones that I, I like in the modern art. Uh, I couldn't miss the Mahrou Ben Bella because first it's a wonderful piece, and then uh, the artist passed away four four days ago. So I, it was a small homage to him. Uh, it's a early magnificent painting uh, of the artist. Then the two uh, others, the Samia Haladi and the uh, uh, and the Muhammad Melehi, uh, I chose them because I was impressed by the by these two late paintings of the artist, 2018 and 2020, and still very powerful because I, I usually like Melehi's early 70s paintings, same thing with Samia Halabi, the 80s, but these two were very interesting and very powerful. That's why I, uh, I, I put them uh, with Mahjou uh, Ben Bella. Uh, then of course Saliba, I can't not choose Saliba Dwayi because he's one of my favorite artists. And this is a very beautiful painting, uh, the 70s. I, I knew it from before and I see it again now and uh, I was very happy to see it back. That's why yes, they are indeed a beautiful selection. Abraham, thank you so much for this. Uh, Eli, you chose the Nari Ward. Um, it is an extraordinary piece. Tell us why you chose this one. Well, Nari, I came across his work last year at the New Museum. He had a fantastic show in, um, in New York. And this is the first time I encountered Nari Ward. Uh, this is represented by Lehman Mopin, a great gallery as well. So this is coming from a breathing series and breathing panels. Um, and uh, Neri is amazing at um, putting together found objects uh, and everyday commonplace materials to transform, them, to transform them into something incredibly powerful and evocative. And he's brilliant at also addressing uh, pressing issues like social political problems, like poverty, race, and, um, and uh, consumer culture. And I think this comes timely today when we are faced with Black Lives Matter issues and the whole issues around, you know, race and, and problems around the world. So amazing work. Fantastic. Which brings us to our last panelist choice, uh, Uli's choice. And, uh, you know, it's been so fascinating and there have been so many topics we want to talk about. We could have exactly as Elias had talked about socially engaged art in an age where obviously so much is going on socially, but I'm afraid one hour is a short time and we have to keep to our time limit. But uh, Uli, tell us about why this particular work. Uh, I have always been interested in how contemporary artists see their own tradition and a major pillar of their tradition is calligraphy. And uh, this artist has a very interesting way to blend the Western world and the Chinese world. It's called Love Me and if you look very closely, you see that it's actually in English and in our alphabet. You know, you see the L O V E M E. Yes. So the appearance is 100% yes. uh, Chinese, but actually it's a blend of two cultures. Fusion, wonderful. Well, thank you everybody. We've overrun our time. It's been wonderful to have your really special viewpoints coming from the journeys that you've each come, the experiences, the rich experiences you've had in collecting. For me, it's been a learning experience. I'm sure the audience have equally appreciated it. As I say, my only wish is that we'd had longer to be able to go into other themes, other questions. There's so much to talk about at the moment, um, but this is all we can do at the moment. And we're grateful to you, grateful that you all made time to be with us today. Thank you again, Abu Dhabi Art, and stay tuned for our next, uh, session, which will be on June 24th, chaired by the extraordinary Mariam Eisler with Anna Summers Cox and the Anita Zabludovic, Philip Colbert, Manal al -Dwayan. Really fabulous panel. You're going to really enjoy that. Take care and thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.